Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our meditation is based on the Old Testament lesson just read, Isaiah's prophecy concerning the ministry of John the Baptist. You will see that when you lack the right words to say, your God stands ready to fill the gap with his word of life. Again, as Isaiah summarizes the message John was sent to proclaim, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So far the text, let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus, bless thy word, that we may trust in thee. Amen. The peculiar thing about all those times when you've been left for a loss of words is that, despite the fact you don't know what to say, we tend to keep talking. Something still comes out. Even if just a murmur deep within, like an inner thought, heart arrhythmia, when you're the one surprised surprisingly turn to for advice, and all you can think to say is, why me? Uncomfortable situations you'd rather have go away, why, why bother me? Or when you know something desperately needs to be said by someone, but the heart simply stammers away, but what, what do I say? It's this inner dialogue swirling about within, what, what do I say, which ironically leads the mouth to say just about anything, as if that's the better alternative to, to nothing. Uh, speaking in cliches like, it'll be okay, when it clearly is not, saying whatever might make the conversation fade away or move on to some other topic, only having the right words, it would seem, after the fact. Which is why when you can see these kinds of conversations headed your way from afar, the mind tries rehearsing how it'll go down in a play-by-play -play of exactly how you'll shoot down every objection offered. But are you now just babbling nonsense to yourself? Even as a pastor, it might surprise you, there are times when I'm compelled to go have a difficult conversation that I might drive around the block a few times, talk it out to myself in the head, get down all the right things I'll say, until I finally show up to the door. Not because I magically figured it out, but because I finally gave up trying to. Just do it. Just show up and see what happens. Which, in a sense, is all you can do. As our lesson today clarifies that each of these situations you find yourself in, which you might not have chosen on your own, you have not merely stumbled into them, it is the Lord who has brought you there. As Isaiah records, the voice said, cry. The blunt manner with which it's stated, the voice said, cry. This is no gentle nudging, but as if the Lord presses you into the corner, leaves you with no other option than to open up that mouth. Under such pressure, then, what heart wouldn't begin murmuring away, why me? Why you, when, as the saying goes, words fail me? How could, when your words let you down, how could what you have to offer not disappoint him? Well, the prophecy we consider this morning, which properly speaking 
concerns John the Baptist, his ministry, his preaching, we find that the unique feature of the Christian conversation and Christian conduct in this fallen world is that it begins with you redirecting that question, what shall I say, back to the God who put you there in the first place. For when this voice, which the first day of creation cried out, let there be light, and there was, when this voice says to his created thing, cry, this particular soul, John, called to cry out in the wilderness, he's bold enough to talk right back. And he said, what shall I cry? As a sinner like you and me, John the Baptist's first reaction would have been some inner babble, no different from yours. What, what do I say? But here we see the grace worked in this prophet's heart uh, that the Spirit transforms our doubt into a godly humility. For John asks, in essence, the same question you have, but without the stammer, stutter, or slinking away, John directs his heart's murmur right back to the Lord who placed him there out in the wilderness to speak. What shall I cry? In faith, that when you go to the source, the giver of all good things, he'll tell you precisely what. As Isaiah records, all flesh is grass, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Here is the whole counsel of God, the entirety of what he has to say to us, encapsulated in briefest form, his law and his gospel. The law, all flesh is grass. That flesh being you and everything which blossoms forth out of you, your heart, your mouth. The, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. In light of this law, which so reveals our frailty, it, it should be no surprise our words are so often empty that the ones which linger a bit are often accompanied with a sting of regret. And ultimately, none of them nearly as important as you rehearse them to be for after our bodies wither away, so too will fade our words, soon remembered no more. Surely the people is grass. But our God, never at a loss of words himself, he keeps talking. Because without his truth, were he not to keep speaking, there'd be nothing worth saying. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Meaning, if what you and I have to offer one another withers, fades, and dies, then life, healing, and strength can only be found in the word of the Lord, which endureth forever. This is the message God sent John to proclaim, that just as the Spirit had worked in John's heart to take his memory right to the Lord, John's message out in the wilderness was for the mortal men who gathered round him to close their mouths in repentance and thus prepare their hearts to listen the same, because their ears were about to take in eternal truths spoken from the mouth of 
God himself. For John was sent to point him out in visible fashion, the eternal word come in human flesh, just like yours, behold your God. Born of a woman to come gather you out of our spiritual wilderness and guide you through this life filled with speechless moments into eternal bliss with him, Jesus was the mediator who reconciled that law and gospel John was commissioned to proclaim that all flesh is grass, but the word of our God shall stand forever, reconciling these two into one message of freedom from sin, death, and hell. The good news that the eternal word was made flesh in order to make your flesh as eternal as he is. Accomplished when Jesus faded into death on a cross and withered away under the hot wrath to each of our sins in order to rise like the first blade of spring risen to bring life and light to the field of humanity as a whole. For an account of Jesus' death and resurrection, the breath of God, which should rightfully make us wither and fade, now makes you evergreen in his sight. As the risen Savior spoke to his disciples, peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I that each instance your words have failed you and those he sent you to might fade away into his all-forgiving love. As he replaces our lack of words with that very message given to John. And when the Lord Jesus had said this, he, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Which means the law and gospel John was called to cry out in the wilderness, All flesh is grass, for the word of our God shall stand forever. Your God calls you to speak and live the same. To retain sins, to speak and live according to God's immutable standard of right and wrong. To remit sins. To speak and live the gospel. Forgiveness. Jesus as the solution to every tongue-tied moment of life that when your mind murmurs and searches about in vain, what, what do I say? You might not leave it hanging out there as some rhetorical statement made, meant to fade into thin air, but learn from John, who took his, what shall I cry, right to the source. Letting your inner doubts be vocalized out loud to the one who already hears it deep in that heart and find in his self-revelation, holy scripture, every sad sight there is to be seen, and the only good news there needs to be heard, openly revealed. You see, when I shared how, even as a pastor, I at times have to drive around the block a few times, talk it out to myself before I finally give up, just show up and see what happens when i do i do not just start talking i show up in repentance of my vain efforts to find the right words and show up in the prayerful confidence that there are only two things to be talked about sin flesh like grass and grace the eternal word made flesh that whatever it is, 
I'm about to see in any difficult situation I encounter is no more and no less than what God says I'll find. All flesh is grass. And what needs to be cried out is Jesus, his forgiveness. All of which actually begins since I have already had to silence myself in order to walk through that front door actually begins by keeping my mouth shut as I start out by listening hard to what your God is telling you through the soul he has placed before yours. A soul with the same lack of words as you in need of the word made flesh you brought through the door with you. Which means sometimes not really opening the mouth too much at all. Just being there as silent proclamation of the Jesus who is always there for you. There is no such thing then as being for a loss of words. Not when every blessing spoken by your God rests upon you and goes with you wherever he leads Take all your heart holds right to the source, trusting his word to be your guide. That instead of blowing hot air all over the place, you might instead be a breath of fresh air. Your conversation, your conduct in humility, making straight in the desert a highway for our God, and thus by his grace, greening things up a bit all around you, as much as we this season adore our church and homes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now the peace that passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.